is excitement every night on NBC. For life in the fast lane, be there. You can NBC there, be there. This is the episode many of you have been waiting for. The ultimate clash of the supercars. Well, at least that's what TV Guide called it. Today, we are unpacking one of the best episodes of Season 1. The introduction of car. Uh, no, not that car. There, that's better. This car. Can Michael save Bonnie after she's kidnapped by Wilton Knight's evil prototype? Who is eating Kit from the inside out? Where is Rev's brother Daryl and his other brother Daryl? I'm Larry, this is my brother Daryl. That's my other brother, Daryl. <laughs> Can we perform a science experiment that proves that trust really doesn't rust? I don't know. Let's just dig in and see where this thing goes. Before we dig in, I wanted to give you guys another promo. Unfortunately, once again, we do not have an original NBC promo for Trust Doesn't Rust. So, in lieu of that, let's take a look at a syndicated promo from the USA Network in the 1990s. Enjoy. Check out the car with the attitude. If it weren't for me, you'd be walking. And the man with those eyes. Hi, ladies. David Hasselhoff, Knight Rider. Tomorrow at 5 on USA. Production number 57307, Trust Doesn't Rust. Written by Stephen E. D'Souza. Directed by Paul Stanley. This episode originally aired on NBC Friday night, November 19th, 1982, at 9 p.m. It was filmed October 27th through November 4th of 1982. This was the 8th episode to air and the 10th episode to be produced. The official TV Guide synopsis reads as follows. Michael is assigned to stop Carr, an evil prototype of Kit, programmed to survive at all costs and now on the loose. So let's dig into it. You might have noticed on the left hand side of the title screen in the first few frames of the episode there are these lines here. Um, they, they don't appear in all copies but the copy that they used for the Blu-ray um, appears to have been uh, uh, damaged in some way. So you do see these lines show up. They do disappear fairly quickly. And here we have Michael McRae as Tony. A little known fact, and it's not mentioned in the episode, but it is mentioned in the script. His last name is Coscarelli, C-O-S-C-A-R-E-L-L-I. We don't hear it in the episode, but um, in the episode it's just Tony and Rev. Um, and William Sanderson played the Rev, and his real name, according to the script, is Jeremiah Bodine. B-E-A-U-D-I-N-E. -E. And the reason he's called the Rev, and again, this is part of the script, but it was not in the episode, is he got his nickname because he originally used to be a preacher, but his alcohol problems forced him to leave the church. And if you watch throughout this episode, both of them, you know, are, are essentially drunks. Um, and uh, so that kind of ties into the, the story there. And then the first scene of uh, Kit and Michael, we see this uh, great establishing shot. This is actually reused from the pilot presentation. So you can see that uh, on this dash, this is the one that's actually in the car. In fact, in this top corner, you can see the, that it's actually in a Trans Am. You can see the T-top, uh, the front of the windshield, the A-pillar right there. 
um, and we can tell that you know it still has the night 2000 wording and the the clean look here and we've still got it's hard to see we still got the original Michael Chaffee voice box so this is a scene um, from the pilot presentation that was filmed and you can see Michael's also wearing his uh, red turtleneck and black leather jacket here and then of course when we cut to actual Michael we see he's actually wearing a, a blue shirt and his black jacket so a little bit of uh, continuity error there and here's our first glimpse of Carr and most of you you know you see the scene once Tony and Rev um, flip the breaker box on uh, lab 3 and they walk in and we see some sparks but they're so quick that you probably don't realize you know what you're actually looking at you just see kind of flashes of light so I've I've grabbed these uh, screen grabs here so you can see exactly what we're looking at so you can see car is right here and we see sparks coming off of them and then they get even more intense but this is really neat because you can see the uh, actual warehouse that he's in it's just this completely empty room with a garage door over here and some other man doors but um, uh, that's supposed to be the uh, electricity firing him back up and then a scanner starts going and he comes towards the uh, camera and then moving forward we go to uh, Michael and Kit pulling up to the Knight Museum of Technology this is the hero car we see the um, Michael Chaffe large overhead console the uh, tow bar and note the lack of um, you can't see the the parking lights on on this they're uh, non-active and then we move ahead and uh, it cuts to this scene now a driverless kit and we see this is now the backup to the hero car and we see the squared off overhead console and the uh, PMD seat suit which we discussed in previous installments and now Michael walks in and he's looking around the night museum and um, it's, it's interesting you can see in the background here's the lab the lab three doors and you can see there's the guard laying there which Michael hasn't discovered yet and we've got all this antique equipment but what I always liked is why is this box haphazardly stacked so high you know just waiting for someone to walk under it and fall but uh, I don't know why that's that's stacked like that and then of course Michael rolls out of the way and we've got um, car coming out this is the backup to the hero car we can still see it's got the the seat in there and uh, we've got Tony and Rev in the passenger side you'll find as we go through this episode there's gonna be a lot of discussion about the different cars because it's still they have only had four cars four Trans Ams and the Fliver car as we've discussed previously so they had to make that work with not only one Trans Am on screen but two and it's gonna be interesting how that works and this is the first time we see two Trans Ams on the screen and we've got in the background the backup to the hero car the same one we saw in the last scene with uh, a driverless car and Tony and Rev in the passenger side and we can tell that this in the front is the hero car because if we look very closely we can see the dash and the edge of the TV right there and then we move to the next morning when Tony and Rev are sleeping and we're now at the hero car one thing to note the white wire that we've talked about so many times kind of as a running joke is now covered in gaff tape right there so you can't see it now remember the filming of these episodes is different than the airing of this episode so um, there will still be some more appearances of the white wire but it's ones that are prior to the filming of this episode but the white wire is no more And then we see this great shot of the passenger side of the hero car, which in this episode is pretending to be car. And, um, you know, not too much to note here, except for the fact that um, you get a great shot at the guts of the TVs that are inside of here, the Panasonic TVs. And uh, there's a tray here, and you can see some of the guts right there, and you can see a wire hanging down and a few other things. This is kind of a rare angle. We don't see this angle on 
on uh, the cars very often, so it's neat to see what's underneath there. And Carr's first appearance of his voice modulator. Many of you know this already, but um, they didn't have a full stage dash for Carr. So all they did was they made this bezel and they put it against a gray backdrop. And if you look up close here, you can see how it just kind of is haphazardly cut out of plastic or, or some kind of a film to just kind of push through to make it look like it's uh, it's inside the car, but in reality this is just, all they did was they created a new voice box bezel. And what's interesting to note here is this is the very same bezel that would go on to be used for Kit starting in Hearts of Stone. So they actually developed this bezel many episodes before it would be used for Kit, but here it is used as car. And then we have uh, car self-activating and driving away this is the uh, stunt car, and uh, that's definitely not William Sanderson. <laughs> and pulling away, we can see um, no license plate. But if we look closely, very closely, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see there's two pieces of tape right here, double-sided uh, foam tape. Uh, pretty much on all the license plates, that um, the original license plates, um, that were used in the show. Well, not all of them, but a good portion of them were attached to the cars with uh, foam double-sided tape, uh, just as an extra security measure in case um, they would fall off during stunts or whatnot, in case the, the two bolts at the top weren't enough to hold it in, they, they taped them on just to make sure. So that's what you're seeing here. A strip of tape there and a strip of tape there. And same here. You know, they went to, they removed the plate here. What's interesting to note is, though, there's many scenes in this episode where they use stock footage of Kit, where you can see it's supposed to be car, but it actually has the night license plate on it. And this poor guy at the Three Rings restaurant. Um, the only reason I pause it here is because you only get short glimpses of him, and you don't notice some of the details like his name is actually Duntley and uh, he's got this awesome hat which matches the uh, the drive-through uh, order uh, ringmaster that's uh, outside right here so that's just a neat kind of tie-in that they did and if you look at it you know, it says right here, three ring driving, which is kind of neat. I wonder if we can read any of that. No, not really. Tip top special right there. Yes, you can. So when Tony and Rev, they order the tip top special and it's actually listed there as an option. That's pretty neat. I've never noticed that before. This is uh, the stunt car wearing the rubber shell. We see the seatbelt. We can see the squared off overhead console. and blowing away the ringmaster and great shot once again that is not the rev it almost looks like buzz bundy but it's not buzz bundy either i don't think he is in this episode because of the ski mode later on and then moving forward they destroyed the the uh, ringmaster take a look here at all the debris around here now keep a keep mention of that. So right now we've got a ton of debris right in front of the car, around the car. Uh, remember that. So this is while the burglar alarm is going off and we see sparks in the background. And if you look right before the sparks, you get a glimpse of the crew member right here who's getting ready to light them. So he's there, he's lighting them, he runs off to the to his right, and then you see the sparks. So little goof up there. This is the hero car. There's the chaffe overhead. And then we see car driving away. Note how all the debris is now pushed up against the building. So um, obviously they moved it out of the way so the car could continue off through this direction. Plot your courses, triangulate your sources, and hit the auto cruise because these are some of the filming locations found in this episode. <laughs> And 
And now we're back at Michael, and he's now driving the hero car. So this car is getting a lot of use both as kit and car, as are all of the Trans Ams. And we get another view here, and this is the only time in the entire series where you see Kit's front turn signal actually working. And uh, there you go, right there, the one and only time. And now we move to uh, this scene. Uh, Tony and Rev have evaded capture after the Three Rings restaurant debacle. And one thing to point out here, you know, we're, we're 10 episodes in in terms of filming order. And you can already see that this, this car, which is the hero car, already has a million layers of paint on it. And they're all shoddily put on. And just take a look at the orange peel here. And a giant dent right there. You know, these cars were, were uh, you know, patched together. They were, they were hit. They were dented. They were filled with body filler, repainted, and sent back out, sometimes before the paint was even dry. And they wouldn't mask off things like the door handles or the door locks or even the T-top the bar or, or um, the uh, rubber behind the... Uh, um, side mirrors they would just paint it all so you can see that right here you know on a on a regular Trans Am the center would be silver where you put the key in but they just kept blasting paint over this in fact on the original Knight Rider cars that survived today their key locks are so thick with paint you wouldn't believe it pretty neat and then we move forward to Michael arriving in the backup to the hero car um, at three rings right before he's uh, arrested and uh, if you take a look here we can see the squared off overhead we can also see this is not Michael this is someone else driving up real quick and get ready to pull out and then we're back at the semi and we have um, uh, Bonnie working on kit while Devin talks to the uh, the police officer played by John Hostetter. We actually talked to John a number of years ago for one of our books, and uh, this was one of his first acting jobs. And um, it was he was only on set for a few hours one morning, but he said everyone was was uh, great, and he was very grateful for the work. And um, and uh, this was the first of many times he would play police officers in his career. So now we see Bonnie walking around to Kit. And this is one of the few times you kind of get a glimpse um, underneath Kit's hood. And there's not too much to report, but if you guys are familiar with uh, 82 Trans Ams, we can see, you know, you pick up a few things here. You can see at this point it still has the stock air cleaner. And if we look right down here at the edge of the frame, we can see the original GM air cleaner sticker that's still on there. And... Um, and uh, we can see up here, obviously this is an 82, so it didn't have the ram air induction, so it just had the close-off plate. So that's all correct for an 82. But um, yeah, just kind of uh, neat to see the underside of kit. Um, it wouldn't be too much longer after this episode that the, the crew would ditch the original air cleaners, because anytime they need to work on the engine, it was a lot of work to take those off. Um, so they would ditch those and replace them with a small chrome aftermarket air cleaner. But as of this point, they still have the original GM air cleaner. And now we move to Carr starting his um, crime spree. And we get a glimpse of uh, the original Chaffee dash. This is from the pilot presentation. We can tell by the squared off lights here and the different, you know, the yellows and the reds are not as pronounced on the side. And then um, the montage of, of Carr and his crime spree are just scenes of Kit from previous episodes. So here's a scene right after Kit breaks out of um, the Comtron building. In fact, you can still see the glass trailing behind him. This is at Universal Studios. And then after that, it cuts to the scene where Kit crashes through the door. So they played those actually in reverse in this episode. And then we move forward and we see a montage of Tony and... Um, the Rev counting money and it's interesting because if you look in the background this is uh, an adult movie theater that we see in uh, the kids in the kid friendly uh, Knight Rider show that's on Friday nights and we've got this showing in the background and then we've got Tony and Rev reveling in their uh, newfound wealth but um, 
I don't know where they're going to spend this money because that is clearly not US dollars. Look at that. I'm not sure where they're going to spend that, but hey, they're excited about it. And then the montage continues, and for some reason, Carr has stars on him for this scene, which is again from Slam and Sammy's stunt show Spectacular, but they reuse that. And then we conclude with uh, the newspaper headline, Crime Wave, Crime Wave Continues, Please Helpless. Um, there's not much to see here. You know, there's not even a date on the paper. It's very generic. Um, and then the subheadings are generic. And if you try and read any of this text, it's kind of hard to see. Um, but, uh, yeah, you can't really, the facts... Yeah, you can't read this paper too much, unfortunately, but uh, there it is. So here we get the first glimpse of the laser that Bonnie created to combat Carr. And a um, number of years ago at the 2012 Knight Rider reunion, we got to see this prop up close and firsthand. This prop was rented to the production by a place called Modern Props, which um, is now, I believe, closed. But um, this is one of the many sci-fi props that uh, that company rented out, um, including most of the stuff you see in the semi. That's all from Modern Props. But um, this particular uh, prop we got to see and hold and play with. Uh, back at the 2012 reunion, so it was really neat to, you know, kind of hold that piece of history. And uh, I always found this scene funny. Devin's holding this picture of the uh, laser and telling Michael about, uh, you know, as you can see, it's pretty easy to use and blah, blah, blah. And if you, um, you know, look at the picture, you're like, well, I don't even know what this is. It looks like a high-tech syringe. So um, it's interesting that Devin would be like, oh, anyone can use this when there's clearly no buttons or switches or anything. Okay, so now we're going to move into um, the scenes where after, right after Bonnie is abducted, and this is where it gets starts to get interesting about with the cars. So we've got the backup to the hero car. We've got the squared off overhead here. We can see it's got um, a fake dash in it. The, you've got the, the, the dash is in it, but you'll see later it's just a bunch of stickers on the dash. And we see we still have a rear view mirror mount way up here. So then we move forward, and now we've moved to the stunt car and we see still have the squared off overhead and this is Jack Gill driving here and then we move forward and we've got the hero car as Kit being blind driven with the seat suit with Devin in the background and now we move forward again and now we've got the backup to the hero car and the hero car together on screen this is the car that we own both these cars still exist. This is the car that we own. This is the car that um, uh, was in a museum in Indiana. It's now uh, in storage, but uh, both these cars still exist. And we move forward and we get a great shot as of Jack Gill wearing a fake mustache pretending to be Tony. And we can see here that this car doesn't have any the TVs in it and we've got a round steering wheel, things like that. And we've got a guy pretending to be Michael getting ready to jump over onto this car. And then as soon as he jumps over to this car, it's hard to tell, but we still have the backup to the hero car, but now we have the stunt car wearing the rubber shell. See? So that's not the hero car now. So they only used it until they were about to do a stunt with it, and then they switched it out. And then when we see the close-up of this guy crawling up the hood, now it's the backup to the hero car. The shell is gone. And we've got the squared off overhead here. So as the chase continues, now we've got the backup to the hero car with a malfunctioning scanner. And in the back, we have the roll caged acrylic windowed jump car. And we can tell that even though the car is far away because of the windshield. You can tell that this is, is plexi and it's not glass. And you see how it's almost looks tinted, but it's actually not. It's the plexi versus the, the glass, uh, the regular glass windshield here. And then we move forward and we still have Jack Gill driving. Uh, this is 
I believe the uh, hero car, we see the gull wing in it. And moving forward, and now we're back to the back up to the hero car. And now we move, and this is the acrylic window jump car. You can see how it kind of sits lower in the back because it's weighted down for jumps, and how the A pillar and this whole area is thicker because of the roll cage, and you can see the roll cage bar across the top. And then we switch back, and this is supposed to be car, and now this is the um, back up to the hero car again. And we know that just uh, to refresh because we've got this squared off overhead console and we have a tow bar. The stunt car, the, the one dedicated stunt car they had, has a squared off overhead at this point, but it does not have a tow bar. And that's the easiest way to tell the two cars apart from the outside. And then we move forward and we see an inside shot of, uh, of uh, Bonnie and Tony. And if you look at the reflection in the window, you can actually see the lights of the uh, camera truck right here. And you can see one of the camera guy's feet right here, just hanging off the back of the truck while they're filming. And this is the acrylic window jump car. And you can always tell this car, especially in these first season episodes, because if you just look at it, it just looks like it's already just beat the heck. And that's this car. I mean, it's way down in the back. There's the roll cage. The whole front end is just, it's just a mess at this point. You can see the uh, skid plate underneath. And now we move forward and we're getting ready for this accident. This is the jump car, the acrylic window jump car. This is the same truck that we just saw in uh, No Big Thing. Uh, the one that uh, jumps uh, Devin and, and, uh, the other escapees uh, frees them from the the uh, prison. Uh, this is that same truck. And what's neat to notice is, if we look real closely, this is the second attempt. Th you know, this truck is about to uh, run into the white Firebird from Slam and Sammy Stunt Show Spectacular. But what's interesting to note is you can tell that they've already practiced this once. You can see there's a little bit of crunch here, and if you look, this front wheel is way out of alignment. Um, so they're getting ready to practice it again. And if you watch it, the guy's driving real slow and the whole front end is wobbling because of this wheel. So then we got the, he pat the, the acrylic window jump car passes that. And then you can look here right before the Firebird hits, you can see it's already dented because this is the second attempt at uh, this crash. Apparently they didn't want it to just hit a little bit in the back here. So they redid it, and now they hit on the passenger door of the Firebird. And um, you can see here it caused much more damage. So I think that's kind of the look that they were going after here, the just just uh, really destroying both these cars. And if you look here, that same green L sticker that you see on this car in Slam and Sammy is right there. And then we've got the backup to the hero car as the chase continues and uh, cut to the acrylic window jump car. Look at the front end. Just look at uh, the turn signal indents. You can tell that it's got a roll cage in it. It's just, uh, again, a bit of a mess. Driving fast, still the, the jump car. And um, this car no longer has T-tops. It, it came from the factory with T-tops, but then they took them out and welded a steel roof on it. And you can tell here that it's just... Uh, is no longer a T-top car. And now we're pulling into uh, what is Courthouse Square at Universal Studios. If we were to turn the camera 180 degrees around, we would see the courthouse from Back to the Future here. And we've got um, the stunt car here, and we've got the, the uh, jump car back there. And now, um, this is after the chase, my car gets away, and now we, we move to a, an establishing shot of the backup to the hero car driving by. And what I wanted to show you here is this is what the dash of the backup to the hero car looks like. Now we'll get a better look at this dash um, coming up in the final verdict and in Whitebird, but um, just to kind of give you an idea. So it has a fiberglass shell in here, but there there's no cutouts for the TVs. And you can just barely see it, but where the electronics should be are actually all stickers. Um, so we'll show you that when we get to, uh, especially the final verdict uh, in, a, in a, a couple episodes here, you'll be able to see it. It also has the, the round stunt wheel in it right now. Yeah, there's a better look at some of the stickers. 
So now we move to an interior shot. The only reason I point this out is there's some new damage to the uh, interior. So if we look right up here at the headliner, we see this damage right here. Now normally that wouldn't be something to point out, but that's going to become important later on because we're going to see that damage into season two. And that's going to help us kind of tie the cars together because whenever we we switch to season two, you know, by that time there are many more Knight Rider cars. Plus, some of the roles of the cars used in season one changed in season two. So it, so that damage right there will bridge the gap between season one and season two for this particular car. And I alluded to this in our uh, in the opening mon or prologue of this. Uh, episode but uh, not sure what happened here but there is a giant chunk taken out of the side of the seat and I know most of you have noticed this before and we'll see this uh, in a couple episodes before they end up fixing it so um, just a giant circular hole cut in the side of the seat for some unknown reason and now we have Michael coming to the rescue in the stunt car wearing the rubber shell and you can see the wire underneath that holds the front fenders together and this is supposed to be car and Tony driving away. This is the backup to the hero car. So we have the stunt car, backup to the hero car. And then after he gets away, we see this establishing shot of Kit. And what's interesting to note is that that seat with the hole cut out is now on the passenger side over here. So um, they didn't have any problems putting driver seats on the passenger side and vice versa. They just did whatever they had to to make it work. So in this case, they moved that driver seat over the passenger side. And now we move to this shot of the backup to the hero car. This um, is actually from a, a reuse scene from No Big Thing, which you'll see here in a minute. But uh, you can tell here. We're missing a fog light grill, like we mentioned previously. So we uh, see Kit's fog lights in all of their glory. And as we drive by, this is how we know it was reused from No Big Thing. Because look, that's not Bonnie, that's Mary Margaret Humes, Carol Reston from No Big Thing. And then we move to an interior shot of uh, Michael and Bonnie in the hero car. Uh, we still have the tape up here. We can also see part of the mount for the lighting and the cameras right here. And Tony maniacally uh, laughing as the guards try to um, shoot through car. So this is the hero car. And if you look right here, you see this round circle? This is... Um, residue, I guess you could say, left over from one of the camera and lighting mounts on the car. Because in the first season, they used this hero car as the close-up insert car quite a bit. And um, that meant that this car always had equipment attached to it. And that's what that circle is right there. And we get a close-up of um, the front of car wearing the rubber shell getting ready to push the boxes into uh, the the guards here. And yeah, you can see they're shooting at him. We've got car here with the rubber shell. You can see the the uh, band that's holding the shell onto the car. We've got no license plate here, but we see the tape residue again. And now we have Michael um, driving up, getting ready right before car jumps over Kit to escape the museum. And this shot is uh, kind of neat because you can see that this is all just a fake wall. You can see the real building behind it, and you can see the fake wall that they built here um, so they wouldn't damage any actual structure. This is the acrylic window jump car. You'd think that they would use the jump car in the scene to actually jump, but they don't. So we've got the acrylic window jump car here. We move forward and we get this great shot. This is still the jump car, but you get this great shot of uh, the top of it here. And now we see that they're actually using the stunt car to do the jump in this scene. This is the jump car and it's got um, paper over the side window. So you can't see that uh, there's actually no one in it because they're supposed to be, uh, Michael is uh, supposed to be in it along with Bonnie. But um, 
yeah, this is the sunk car breaking through here. And what's great is if you watch this very closely, watch where Kit lands. He doesn't actually, the ground is down here, but watch where he lands. He actually lands on some platform up higher over here. See? And then the car goes this weird, awkward direction. So I'm sure there was a lot of damage done to it. But for some reason, it's not landing on the ground. It's landing up here off, off uh, frame. And then immediately after that, we move to this scene. This rig right here is a Comtron rig. If you look, the paint scheme, which is actually part of the Universal Studios transportation fleet at the time. But this is what we call the, uh, the Comtron rig. And then we've got, uh, again, this guy who looks like Buzz Bundy. He might be Buzz Bundy, pretending to be uh, Tony at this point, getting ready to um, spin around. And then we have uh, Kitten Carr's uh, confrontation. Uh, I guess this is the first time that they've uh, confronted themselves uh, nose to nose, I suppose you could say. So in the original script, there was supposed to be a, an exchange of dialogue between Kit and Carr here, where Carr originally tells Kit that while being one of a kind is special, so is being two of a kind. And that will uh, come into play again later in this episode, um, well at least according to the script. The final scene of the episode where um, Kit is left alone in the semi, originally it was supposed to be Kit would replay this very conversation where Carr was saying, um, where Carr was telling Kit how special they were. But because that was cut from this scene, it was then cut from the end of the episode as well. And then we get a close-up here of uh, the uh, hero car. And then this is the uh, stunt car. And we can see here, the uh, we know this is the stunt car because if you see, look at this closely, look at the headlight door here, see how it's bent and crooked. And then we see, move to this shot and we can see it's still bent and crooked here. And there's no tow bar here. We know that this is the, uh, the stunt car and getting ready to jump over the police barricade. So here we've got the backup to the hero car, but then as soon as it cuts, it moves, and now it's the uh, uh, roll cage jump car backing up. And you can see here we've got, they put uh, plastic tint, just draped it over the side windows here, just to, to uh, mask that it's supposed to be a uh, car by himself. Well, I guess Tony's still, still in at this point. And then we move, we're back up to the hero car again with Bonnie controlling this uh, easy to use laser according to Devin. And now we move to the hero car. So look, squared off overhead, Chaffe, much cleaner, nicer. And this is the uh, jump car again, and this is uh, probably Jack Gill who's playing Tony. Um, so uh, again, in the original script, as a way of reducing weight, Carr pressed a button on his dash that was called load jettison, and it was supposed to open the trunk and um, expel all the jewelry. So apparently the jewelry from the jewel heist is all in Carr's trunk, which isn't established in the episode. But um, in the script, after that happened, Tony protested Carr's uh, jettison of the jewels, so then Carr just got sick of him and ejected him out as well. And uh, we do see the ejection of Tony out of Carr in the episode, but that's the, um, the reason behind it. So here we go. He's about to eject him out. And again, we've got a lovely look at a dummy here. And look at this uh, fake seat that they just kind of put over the, uh, the ejection platform. Clearly not a PMD seat. And then we move to Carr um, doing a, a ski mode. If you look here, the laser was supposed to hit his headlight door, but um, there's actually no headlight door there. They removed the headlight door and the headlight, I think, so they could put a, um, an, a little explosive device in there to spark to pretend that uh, he was actually getting hit by a laser. And then, of course, we move to a wider shot, and Carr is supposed to be by himself, but there's Buzz Bundy driving him right there. And now we move to uh, 
what is uh, the uh, the uh, backup to the hero car and we can see we've got the um, uh, PMD seat suit person in here you can see the seat here if you look closely you can see kind of a, a, a cover behind it and then we've got a, someone in the passenger seat here which doesn't fit either scene because Kit is supposed to have Michael and Bonnie in them and Carr is supposed to not have anyone in them so this just doesn't fit. Okay and now we're at the scene where Carr is about to jump over Kit and this car on the bottom is once again the roll cage jump car that is not going to be jumped. But we can see here so the car they are using to jump is the Fliver car. So, in this episode, all five of the vehicles that they have are being used. So, we've got the flipper car with the shell on top here, and we've got the uh, roll cage jump car underneath. And there's another angle of it, and you can tell that this is the jump car. You can see the, the underside of the Doom Buggy. You can see how the body, the Trans Am body, is wider than the Doom Buggy shell. Look at the, uh, the tires and where they're mounted. And then, of course, whenever we transition to this angle, this is actually the roll cage jump car. So they did a takeoff for this jump with the flipper car, and then they switched to the roll cage jump car for the actual jump. And there you can see it landed, and you can tell this is a Trans Am. You can see how the roof's flat. Kind of gives you uh, gives gives it away that it's the roll cage jump car. And then there we go. You can see the dummy. Uh, on the inside. This is when uh, Michael and Kit jumped to pursue. They did another jump with the uh, roll cage jump car. And in this case, you can see the people inside. You can see the roll cage right here on the A-pillar. And then we transition to a uh, car driving away and we can see that um, it's on the famous uh, single lane uh, white railed bridge. The same one that we saw in Just My Bill and the same one that we saw in No Big Thing. And here it is again. And for all of you uh, keeping track, here is the John Ward nose car. We don't get too good of a, a look at it, but this is stock footage from the pilot presentation, and there it is again. So this is supposed to be car driving uh, erratically, causing accidents. Um, this is one of my favorite shots of this roll cage jump car because you get a nice close up and you can again just see how screwed up this car is. You get a good look under here at the um, skid plate which starts here. It runs down underneath and you can see it bolts up over here. But look at this window. They because car was supposed to be driving by himself, they put this plastic or this paper that uh, tried to mimic darkened windows over the uh, plexiglass side. And it looks like they just screwed it into the plexi right there. Um, very crude, but I suppose effective. And then we get this side view, and the car is just driving all over the place. And I'm sure it didn't handle well after all the jumps, and it, it was probably in, in pretty bad shape, as you can see. And uh, there it continues, and it's uh, it's a mess. You can see the the uh, driver's side window is poking out. It doesn't fit into the uh, frame of where the window should be. And then we transition over to uh, what's supposed to be Michael and Bonnie in the backup to the hero car, uh, giving pursuit to car. And then we get this great inside shot of the hero car and uh, as you can see it still doesn't have any uh, you know the turbo boost button or any descript buttons these are all still the, kind of the nondescript ones that they put in there 7 DLA uh, 6 RM things like that and then we have kitten car talking back and forth to each other and uh, the thing to note here is obviously the giant dent in the uh, hood scoop on uh, on kit and then we turn to Carr, who is supposed to be driving by himself. But if you look here, we've got these two guys. This guy with sunglasses on and this guy with a mustache driving car. I don't know where that came from, but there you go. And then getting ready for the big collision. And of course, here we have the roll cage jump car in the back here. 
this one, it's, it's hard to tell from this angle which car this is, but this is definitely the roll cage jump car. And then, of course, we have the hero car facing off against the, uh, the stunt car. That was, I'd say, pretty brave of them to even use the hero car in the scene, but I guess they needed a point of view shot with the dash. And this is the only car with the dash, so there you go. And then, everyone knows this, but the big finale where car goes off the cliff is from the movie, the 1977 movie, The Car. And um, this, what you're looking at here, is not a still that I took from that movie. It's actually a still from Trust Doesn't Rust. So for a brief second, one frame, you get a look at the car here before it goes off the cliff. And then there it is going off the cliff, which again is, of course, another vehicle. It's not obviously a Trans Am, but it's not the vehicle they use for the car either. It's just yet another one. And then we end, Michael and Bonnie are happy that car has been destroyed. And they have this brief moment here where they kind of both look at each other and both think about embracing, but then decide not to. And I guess this is kind of a remnant of what we were talking about in previous episodes where Michael was, was after Bonnie for uh, romantic reasons. And then that turned into more of a platonic friendship. Well, here you kind of get a glimpse of, you know, maybe there is something there. But of course, it never goes any further than this. And then we end with uh, Kit alone in the semi talking about how being alone is a very familiar feeling. And this is what I was talking about earlier uh, in this episode where uh, Kit was originally supposed to be reviewing his confrontation with Carr, where Carr told him that uh, being one of a kind is special, but so is being two of a kind. But obviously that was, that was all cut. And uh, this is a great angle. We never see this angle of the semi again, but um, you kind of get a good look at the the uh, set that was on stage one. If you look in the very back, way up here in the top, you can see one of the walls of stage one, and you can see the top of the, of the semi-set roof. And obviously they moved this entire wall out to get this uh, perspective angle. But um, yeah, cool shot. Never see it uh, in that way again. <laughs>
And just like that, we're done with Trust Doesn't Rust. I hope the last 50 minutes have flown by for you because you were enjoying it so much. Next time, we will bring the hammer down on the next episode of Knight Rider, The Final Verdict. Thanks for watching, guys. See you next time. And now, while we listen to Joe's selection of Knight Rider music that we received directly from Don Peak himself, we'd like to thank these Patreon supporters. Look at you guys scrolling up the screen to my right. Wait a minute, how can you tell which side is my right since you can't see me because I'm not on camera? Oh well, you know what I mean. We're featuring these fine supporters at our Knight Rider prop restorer level. Thank you very much for your support. And for those of you at the Knight Rider history hunter level, we're recognizing you right now in the description. Now if you enjoyed seeing this golden nugget of Knight Rider history being rescued from obscurity, then please, consider supporting us on Patreon. Your support would empower us to bring you even more of these historical nuggets. We are the Knight Rider Historians. Till next time, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.